Kevin, welcome to the show, mate. Thank you for inviting me. Good Pleasure. to see you. Thank Good you. to see you. Um, let's roll all the way back. Where did you grow up and how did you get convicted of murder? Bloody hell. Right, so uh, I grew up in the countryside in Harefield, Middlesex. It's a uh, small village. I was. It was reportedly meant to be the largest village in England at one point. I don't know how true that is, but a uh, lovely village, very rural, lots of farms, lots of pubs. Um, we had a farm on our school, which we used to have to attend, which was great. Mm. I used to nip down there after school sometimes and nick a chicken. <laughs> Bloody hard chasing around yeah, the yard, I tell you, I used to get them, smack them over the head <laughs> and chuck them in a bag. I walk out of school and bag bumps them out like that. <laughs> 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 well, like, the first one I nicked, I got home, they have like rings around their feet yeah. for different colours, different ages and that. Of course, I had the bleeding eldest one in there, about three years old. Yeah. Tasted like cardboard. <laughs> but still free. Happy days. Yeah. We've got home, home pluck it, cooked home, it up. Took it home, plucked it. You got to gut it and stuff. Yeah. And then it was cooked in a stew. Was and, what right. was, and what was school life like for you growing up, growing in those sort of uh, teenage years? Loved school. Mm. I, I didn't bunk off school. I might have bunked off school two or three times. But then I went down the lakes and uh, messed around there. Um, I liked school. Mm. I liked it because of the sport. Mm. I wasn't too keen on on educational side of matters until I had to sit down and prove to everybody once that I I could do it. And I got A's and B's, um, and I got expelled. So expelled for what? A number of things. I had punch up with a teacher, um, punched a teacher a couple of times. He bit me. Uh, I was caught in a sixth formers hut. Yeah, with a friend of mine, and he was manhandling me out. Mm. And, uh, you know, proper man handling me. Um, I punched him, he bit me, I punched him again, I got expelled. And how old were you at that time? Uh, 14. 14. Mm. Did you grow up, did you grow up in a family of, of, or around people that were violent as a young kid? Did you see a lot of violence or you were around it? Uh, no, I was lucky really, I grew up in a loving family. Um, got uh, three brothers, one I don't see from childhood, but uh, my dad and me married. Uh, and I got four sisters. So I did grow up in violence as a child in that school violence. My brother, and I've said this before, but my brother had an, an accident and he used to have to wear a, what's called a, like a Mr. Magoo crash helmet. Oh, yeah. You'd remember yeah, that yeah, dodge, yeah. wouldn't you? Hmm. Uh, and what, what, him stop, stop him banging himself in? He had all plates yeah, okay, in his head. Okay. He nearly died. He got yeah. run over, run out from behind the bus. Okay. Uh, slipped my mum's hand, Bosch gone straight out on the road. So he nearly died. Um, and he had to go to school with that crash helmet on. That brings yeah. problems. Yeah. So from a very early age, I was fighting at school um, for my brother. Mm. My brother took care of matters himself when he got older. Yeah. By the time the skull's grown over the plates and he's, you know, he's, he's out of danger. But mm. as a young child, it was very problematic. Mm. And then with that, my brother went on. He like he started drinking at 14. So in the pubs, was he younger or older than older. you? Older. He was older. Okay. So he was six, I'll be 12, he was yeah. 14. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of travellers in the village where I used to come from. So take your top off, I'll fight the hardest man in here. Yeah. He was doing a bit of that, young man, you know, full of testosterone, a bit of beer in him, yeah. like you do. Mm -hmm. And um, so that I was fighting at a very young age. And I don't like to talk about the violent side, but yeah, I was fighting as a young man. It was a matter of course, not because yeah. I want to go and have a fight. Mm. And what was, your, what was your journey from school then, from that sort of 16-year-old onwards? I was younger than that. I was working from 12 years of age. Full-time, that was. I was working before that. But I was working in a baker's at 5 o'clock in the morning, uh, paper round. And it was very dark. I mean, I've got to tell you, you needed a bleeding uh, bravery award to do a paper round around there because some of the lanes, the, the trees had grown right over like yeah. a tunnel. Yeah. Pitch black. Yeah. All right, you're absolutely crapping yourself, really. Mm. Um, at 12 years of age, because you're right, it's still pitch black in the morning, wind and rain and snow, whatever, in the countryside. Um, I started work and then I just went along that course. Um, did very, very well working. And I went out and got an apprenticeship when I was... I started work when I was 15 when I got expelled from school. Mm. And they sent me to a school called Southbourne. Originally, they wanted to send me to a school called the Phoenix, which was a special school. Where was that in the country? That, the, the, that was actually in West Straton, and I'd have had to bike there 
he said to wear myself down yeah. and stuff like that and I just didn't go mm. so they sent me to another school called Southbourne which is in uh, Rysland Manor and I used to have to sit in a class in a, a storeroom on my own and I had two classes that I was allowed to mix with and it was, I think it was French and English I believe so that was half hour sessions and I was put back in a bleeding storeroom mm. well the devil finds work for idle hands doesn't he mm. so for instance it was um Bonfire night, so I bought a load of bangers, run down, lit them, run down the corridor, threw them all in the classrooms, went back to the bleeding storeroom. Of course, it was me, they knew it was me, <laughs> so that didn't go down well. Yeah. And it didn't go down well that I rode into school on a motorbike, mm. parked it in the bleeding car park. Mm. So I see myself as what I believe an adult at the time. Yeah. I've got my own flat, I'm yeah. sharing it well, I'm sharing it with a friend of mine. I was working with a local builder, getting four days' work release, mm. and I was working in a chip shop. In the in the evening and weekends, mm. so I and I loved it. You don't feel like you're working yeah. if if you like what you're doing, yeah, didn't you? So career wise, I then went off and got an apprenticeship carpentry, and I did that for three years in various different companies, and then I stopped all of that, started buying and selling cars. Um, and what sort of age were you buying and selling cars here? Eighteen, roughly eighteen. Okay. Mm. And what was your life like outside of work at that time? Um, well, I, I, I had just had a baby. I was with, I met a girl when I went to Southbourne. Um, I fancied her mate, actually. <laughs> Standard. Standard. But I was told she fancied me. She was prettier, yeah. so I went out of her. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a better deal because I ended up having two children yeah. with her. And uh, she's a, still, she's an absolute lady. Mm. Uh, Kim Purcell. Mm. Real class act, Kim. So... Still friends with her? Uh, I, I see her, yeah, so of course. Her, yeah. We speak if we need to. She lives in another area now. Yeah. Um, we had a first son, Aaron, and then, and then Tommy. I had, mm. We got a flat. I bought a flat as well at that time. Uh, I got a mortgage and bought a gaff. So we had a council place, and I went and bought one. Mm. But I bought it to sell it, mm. and I did. I sold it on, took some money out of it. Yeah. Uh, so I was already going off on that, on that path mm. of life. And what was, the, what was that journey between then and... The day you got convicted, it's a bit of a roller coaster mm. ride, really, because um, I started working licensed premises. Uh, that I didn't. What I, nightclubs, bars? I was eighteen. I looked yeah. like a bleeding manager. Yeah. So I could come up to you. I wasn't the size I am now. Yeah. I was eleven stone seven, and I was boxing. Yeah. So I'd, I'd approach you and talk to you, yeah. and you're not. You don't feel threatened, does do you? When someone small comes up to you, mm. more fall in for don't, mm. you know, of course, don't yeah. know to yeah, anybody. Absolutely, yeah. but I could talk to you and you wouldn't have to put your hands up. Yeah. And if it got to that, I said, look, can I talk to you by the door? Yeah. Get in the door and you're gone. Yeah. But I started working to premises, licensed premises, um, as well as buying and selling the cars and wherever else that journey takes you. Yeah. Um, and it does take you on quite a mm. journey, doesn't absolutely. it? As you know from the mm. festivals. Mm. Uh, Hippodrome, uh, all different gaffs, you know, mm. leading up in London. So you're running the doors of these gaffs? I had my own company. The, you had your own company, did you? 120 doormen. You have 120 doormen on your books? At the time, did you? when, if you needed a doorman, mm. then you needed a doorman because it kicked off there. Yeah. Not like now where there's doormen right across the spectrum. Yeah. If you've got a clean licence, you can have a, a pass. Yeah. They were proper bouncers back then. Yeah, to have a fight. Yeah. Or be able to talk to people. Yeah. Um... I used to say to my lads, listen, you're here to manage our guests. Yeah. You're not here to bleed and beat them up. Yeah. Because if you beat them up, you might think, oh, listen, he deserved it. But you're not here. Yeah. You're here to restrain people and maim them out. So if you lose me a gaff and that gaff gives me £250 a week profit, mm. back then, it weren't a bad bit of no, going. For a yeah, pub, for instance, right? Of course, yeah. But I had 16 pubs and six clubs on the go. Yeah. Full time. Yeah. Uh, was it that many? 16? I have to look at it. It's about so 12, pu uh, 12 pubs and, and six clubs. I yeah. had, so uh, then you get your, yeah. your little bits here and there, didn't you? So if I'm getting two and a half a week out of there, that's a grand a month, that's 12 grand a year. Yeah. So I'd say to you, if, if you lose me that mm. place, you've just took £12,000 a year out of my out pocket. Of my pocket, yeah. I'm not going to be very happy, yeah. as you wouldn't be. Yeah. So be mindful of that, lads. Mm. But it took me yeah. off into an area where it's problematic. Yeah. But I, I purchased the the name of the company to go into camera security so it was a stepping stone what year are we talking here Kev? 91 91 okay early 90s okay historia yeah okay 
places so like that. So bouncers only come in on the scene then. Uh-huh. So I grew up living above pubs. My old man was the first one to bring bouncers on the door. Big lumps, because you had to. But there was no badges back then. It was literally, you're a big lump, come stand on the door with a bomber jacket. It wasn't, or even even back then, you put a, a, a suit jacket on some of yeah. them. Yeah, you used to have the zip-up jacket, the yeah. little flight jacket. That's right. All my lads had them. Yeah. All had matching uniforms. Yeah. I tried to take it a little bit more professional at the time. Walkie-talkies, had to sign a contract. Uh, not all of them did, but they criminal, yeah. severe records. But yeah. um, The I funny had, thing is, back then, you, you could have a criminal record, you could still stand on the door. Yeah. And it's all changed. All changed. Yeah. I never had, I did have Nickens on the door, but um, that was me mm. before I started my own company mm. um, because people used to think they could take the piss out of me. Yeah. And Did you find that you were a target at all? Well, you looked young. Yeah. And you're not a no big size. Yeah. So people would be a bit gobby to you in the end when they're drunk or yeah. might try it on. Yeah. So there was a portion of that. But once you get a regular door, people uh, know you are. Know you are. Yeah. You meet the customers, you get a bit of a base, don't you? Yeah. And what was your route then from then from then onwards running the doors? Did you get into trouble at all? Well, you do get into trouble, don't you? Mm. Because it's, it is problematic. Mm. Um, a few nickings, violence. Um, it's, yeah, it was problematic for me. I started ringing cars. Mm. Um, that was very lucrative. Mm. Like I said, I'd buy a car for four thousand pound and sell it for fourteen. Mm. It'd only be missing its interior mm. at the time. You could and a bonnet and a few doors and that, and you could go and get them from scrapyard. Yeah. Or you'd nick them. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't do it now, of course. Yeah. But when you're eighteen. Yeah. Uh, and it was quite large at the time. What else did you get nicked for in that period of working the doors? Handling stolen goods. Okay. So I had a yard and I split the yard up and took some rents from the yard. It used to give me £500 a week in my pocket mm. with, after expenses. Mm. But I had the air, an aircraft hangar or, or what's called like a, a, a Nissan hut, which is a mini aircraft yeah. hangar. You can get a juggernaut in there. Mm. So you'd have a lorry load of whiskey or yeah. um, bits and pieces. I had computers. I never forgot it. I had... Um, I ain't going to mention the name of the, the computers I had, but uh, that was very good. Mm. A whole bleeding lorry load of goods were dropped out to me of these computers, and mm. I was selling a basic computer then for 750 quid. Wow. In the 90s? 91. Wow. But it was a big computer yeah. system. Yeah, I remember those. That was very, very lucrative for me. Um, I have said this, so I'm going to say it to you now. The best seller I had was women's time packages. Was it? Was it? Cleared them in a week. So did you? The whole bleeding van. <laughs> van loads of them. Gone. Up the school, mate. I'll yeah. have a bag of that. I'll have a bag of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Gone. Yeah, and sure. washing powder. Yeah, okay. Went like, so anything you can get your hands on to turn a pound note, you were on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, there's, there's, there's always something you might not be. You'd say, no, I'm not interested. That's too much hard work. Yeah. Uh, but pretty much, if it if it's cheap, it's Did you ever get involved in drugs? I don't like drugs, No. no. Uh, I, I ain't saying I haven't taken drugs, yeah. and I've tried an ecstasy here and there. Yeah. Back in the day when yeah. they was a lot cleaner than what they yeah. are now. Yeah. Um, I don't like cocaine. Mm. I call it a cunt drug. Got, yeah, you talk great. like one, you act like one, you become Spend one. Spend a fortune. You're in the toilet all night, be, pretending you're a gangster, and you're a dustman in yeah. the week. Yeah. But you become gr- aggressive a lot of the yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't agree with it. I've had uh, family problems that I've had to put into rehab and mm. such. And I think it destroys life. Yeah. Look at society now. Yeah. If it was a recreational drug, yeah. like ecstasy back in the day, yeah. that didn't destroy lives as, as cocaine does. Mm. So that gave me a, a bad feeling. Mm. Um, dealing drugs, I'm not really a drug dealer yeah. in terms of, I like to go to work, unless I'm not really a drug dealer. Uh, when I was 18, 19, and people were talking about the rhubarb and custards and yeah. the, uh, Dennis and Menaces and that. Yeah. And you got your pals, so oh, listen, I'll say, oh yeah, I know someone wants 100 of them. Yeah. So you're passing them on and you're getting a drink out of it. Yeah. But it's a bit- It's different. It's different. It's you are different. dealing yeah. in drugs though. Yeah. But you're a middleman. Yeah. And it wasn't to the proportion of- Proper. What proper, I could yeah. have done. Yeah. And uh, it just never in, yeah. it appealed to me. So what happened between the period of 91 and 96? Um. So I went to Spain. Yeah. I got nicked for a kidnapping, first of all. 
and I kidnapped the wrong fella. <laughs> but I say that now. <laughs> <laughs> he he was we were giving him as a uh, as the person that was meant to have committed the, the crime. And what, it was, cri- what crime was it? So I worked for a company called Scotts and Fetzer, and if I thought there was money, that I'd go and work. Yeah. So I had the security company that yeah. was bringing between eight and twelve hundred quid a week yeah. into my pocket. I had a head doorman that I was paying him a quarter of the profits. Yeah. So I passed that over. I then in one, I had a, uh, a venue where a lad that used to work for me called Paul Blessing, he could never get enough work on the door. Mm. He stopped working. Mm. He pulled in driving a nine four four Porsche. Mm. I was working that night on the door, and I thought. Yeah, he's jumped up a bit. Mm. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm selling Ubers. I said, I could sell them. Mm. He said, Kevin, it ain't like that, mate. I said, get me an interview. Mm. I went for an interview selling these Kirby mm. Ubers. I sold 26 in a weekend. Mm. And I delivered 16 due to finance and such. Mm. I broke the world record. Mm. I earned £4,700 that weekend. Mm. I thought, this is a bit of me. Yeah. So I went off selling the Kirby's, which took me into a other areas but I ended up earning £15,000 a month basic wage and I got an unsecured overdraft on my wages each month happy days happy days so mm. selling hoovers mm. I went on to Irish life doing mortgages what did you why did you kidnap that bloke right you've got me I, yeah. I lost my track there yeah. thank you so a friend of mine was a factory distributor and he had a hundred machines stolen from his factory this individual was put forward as the man that was part of, he was a storeman, slipping the machines yeah. out. But it wasn't him, it was the other fella. Mm. But he was put forward for it, and they threatened a, a girl who had notified my pal mm. about the thefts. She was threatened with a knife, and so was a young baby. Um, they went to the police. The police couldn't do nothing about it, because this was a bit of a football hooligan gang yeah. down there. My friend called me up and said, can you sort it? So I did. I went down there and I took this fellow away. In the back of a boot? Oh, he went straight in the motor. I took him out of a car, put him straight in mine, um, took him away. And I, you know, listen, it ain't, I'm not proud of what I did. Mm. Uh, I ran him over a couple of times, severely beat him. Because I'm just looking at him thinking, put a knife to a baby, yeah, will you? Yeah, can good, have yeah. another dig. Yeah. And whatever reasons, you know. Yeah. And he spent a week in hospital, didn't know his own name, for obviously mm. the, the beating it had taken. I got arrested for that, for kidnapping. So um, I went to prison for that for two years. But Did you get convicted for two years, was it? I had two what trials. To do? And you did what? Okay. I got bail on the first trial yeah. because the police were caught out lying in the dock. They said they'd, they'd contacted a witness. Where I kidnapped the fellow from, there was staff. They had, did an ID parade. And they said, it looks like him, but it's not him. Yeah. The detective inspector put, it looks like him, yes, it's him. She said, I never said that. Mm. And then she come forward and said, also, I was asked to meet the police officers at the end of my road. They phoned me up. I got in the back of the car, there's Kevin Lane's file. She kept saying, Kevin, Kevin. Yeah. My brother said, why do you keep referring to Mr. Lane as Kevin? Yeah. She said, I've seen his file. Yeah. Wow. And then she said, I, I, I wrote a new statement. Of course, I got immediate bail. Yeah. I was on bail in for about 14 months. Mm. I did six months remand. First mm. time I'd ever been in prison. Whereabouts with whereabouts you in prison? Reading. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and how old were you when you first went to prison? 21. Hmm. What was that feeling like when you were in the dock and they went, right, you've got to put it inside? Well, at the time, I, uh, I was in an old Victorian prison. Mm. I became Jim Audley in there. Mm. But that feeling, that feeling of 21, getting convicted, did your heart sink thinking, oh, what's going on with my world right no. now? Or were you okay with it? I was okay with it. It was <clears> a case <throat> of going into the prison, it was a small prison, mm. um, and it seemed exciting that there was no ag like there is now. There was a lot of fights and things yeah. like that, but nothing like it is today. Yeah. And I only got a relatively short period of time. I got two years. In the second trial, the jury came back uh, with a guilty verdict, but then came back again within 20 minutes and said they made the wrong decision. Mm. Um, the judge said, I have to take your first answer. Mm. And he said, I know there's going to be an immediate appeal oh, and a bail application. Well, I told my bail not to make a bail application. I said, I've not given evidence. Mm. I've not lied in the dock. Uh, I've been found guilty. I'm happy with the sentence. Yeah. And I've got two years, two years, two years, and two years to run concurrently. And I thought, well, I'll be out in 
no time at all. Mm. Uh, I went off to Bullingdon then, which was a brand new prison. Um, and then I went to Spring Hill after that because my father passed away whilst I was in Bullingdon. Where's Bullingdon in the country? Oh, it's Bicester. Bicester, Oxford way. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that was the hardest part for me, my father passing away and not getting to speak to him. Was he a big influence in your life, your dad? He's, he's my hero, yeah. you know, your dad's your hero. Yeah, of course. He? But I didn't see my father much from when I was a child, my mum and dad split up. My dad went off his way. Um, difficulties with access and mm. maintenance and stuff like that. How old that. were you when they split? Four. Four, okay. Yeah. Four or five, I can't remember, it's about that age. Mm. Um, Have you ever dealt with that, that trauma back then? I had some, when I came home from the, the my lengthy sentence, mm. I went and, and sought some therapy from uh, a, a psych a therapist in Belvedere. Mm. I actually had two sessions a week and I was with him for quite some time. I was nearly seeing him for nearly a year and a bit. And he said, I would never have known if you'd been in prison, if you hadn't yeah. told me. Yeah. But I did deal with it, and the fact is that he made me sit in a chair mm. opposite me, where my dad was meant to be sitting. He said, talk to your dad as if he's there. Yeah. Now you sit in there and talk to you yeah. as if you're your dad. Yeah. It brought out a lot of emotion. I bet. I bet. It was strange because I was... How old were you at that time when you did that? I was 47. 47, wow. So you might have been carrying 44 years of hurt without realising at the time. Dodge, I had, because also... During that period of time, I hadn't seen my children for nine years mm. due to the categorisation that I was held at. Mm. And you've got a lot going on around you in the prison system when you move into the high security estate and the special secure units where I was held. Mm. And you're a young man in, in an old school system mm. where people have morals and a code of conduct, mm. not like it is now. Yeah. So it's like a... You've arrived in a, in a country you've never been to before, mm. so it's pretty new for a while. Mm. Uh, not exciting, but it's electrifying. There's a lot going on. You're with me. It's, mm. The atmosphere can be electrifying mm. at times, or it can be very tense. Mm. Um, it was difficult, I must say. Mm. So just rolling back there, I want to know what happened on how you got your big sentence. What actually happened? You got accused of murder. So, during the, my, my path with work, I went into sales with the Kirby's, then I did Irish life mortgages. Um, and from that, I thought, I had a relative go to, to Tenerife doing, and he's talking about the timeshares. Yeah. So I went to Tenerife. Whilst I was out there, um, I had some trouble out there. Um, I came back to England as a result, and I was arrested two months after I came back for murder of Bob McGill. What um, year was this? 1995, I was arrested. The murder was in October 94. I got arrested on January the 10th. I, uh, hex of magistrates court. So I'd been up there, and again I looked young and that, and then I'd had a, couple, a fight with a couple of rugby players, and I got arrested for it and charged. Um, I went back up to a pier and they was waiting for me, arrested me, brought me back down to London, at high speed, flashing lights, armed police and that, straight into Watford Police Station. And I thought, you know, like, what's all this about? Mm. Um, but I knew something was wrong by the line of questioning. Thought, this doesn't seem right. They questioned me as if I fucking did it, and they was. So they questioned, said, so was this totally out of the blue that they were like, we need to nick you, take you down to London. So did you know? Did you know anything was coming? Did you know nothing about what was going on? Did you know there was a a murder at that time? I, I knew there'd been a murder. It was big in the area. Yeah. But I didn't expect to get arrested and charged with murder. Yeah. I expected to get pulled in because I'd been led to believe that I had a car in my possession that was used in the murder. It's well, you what? You owned the car? No. No. So I came back from Spain. Yeah. I purchased a Ford Cosworth yeah. Sapphire. Yeah. The day I purchased it, it was stolen off of my drive. Right. I was then offered to be a loan of a car. The car I was offered to be loan was reportedly used in the murder. It's since transpired that the actual car wasn't, but it was duplicated. 
slightly different colour, different colour interior, different yeah. wheels. But it was a different car at the scene to what I was loaned. Yeah. But that didn't come out until some years after I was convicted because the reports of that car were withheld from the evidence. So my evidence was chopped and changed to get me a guilty. Factual, that is. It's in my book, Fitted Up and Fighting mm. Back. So I came back from Spain, got arrested at Westerham. I was bailed. At the time I was in Watford Police Station, there was a corrupt police officer in my case called Spackman. Spackman was a, a Roger Vincent and David Smith's handler. And we've had police officers... Who's come... Roger Vincent and David Smith? So, pass me my book, I'll show you them. So, Roger Vincent and David Smith were working with a, this police officer called Spackman. And they'd given evidence in a number of cases over the years, whereas uh, their charges were dropped. Well, Smith's wasn't, but Vincent's was. Other people got guilty. They were the original suspects. Vincent they were the original suspects of the murder yep. of McGill. Yep. Okay, and why was McGill murdered? Nobody knows. Was he a was he a criminal? Was he a, was he did do people money? He was a face. Was, he was a face. Okay. Enforcer. Okay. And where did he get murdered? And how? He got murdered in Rickmansworth, but he was he's dead now. So let's not talk bad about him. But he was a force to be reckoned with. Uh, in the area and with that comes problems and he got ironed out and we don't know why yet but what did you ask me? How did he die? He died he got died with he got killed with a pump action shotgun uh, so the police say a Mossberg pump action shotgun uh, shot at close range and executed in Rickmansworth What at home? In his car? Walking down the country lane Really? So Roger Vincent was arrested for it with David Smith. Uh, they put me forward in a number of confidential chats where Roger Vincent did. And he said, I want to work with the police, discuss a number of uh, murders that have been committed. He said, I committed those murders, unsolved murders. As a result of that, the police operation completely focused in my direction. Mm. Um, when I got arrested on the 10th, Spackman shut up to see Vincent in Woodhill Prison. So Spackman's the copper? Spackman's the copper. Yeah. He went to prison for four years for theft. Eventually, what the copper did? Detective inspector. Um, always been corrupt. Yeah. Everyone knows that. Yeah. But, I mean, he was going around Roger Vincent's house on his own and going in and going yeah. up to see him in prison as a, as a solicitor, not going as an old bill and that. Yeah. Uh, but they were working together to get more the evidence on me. So this that is Roger Vincent, for anybody who can see that. Now, he looks very happy, doesn't he? Mm. He's, just had his, he's just been charged with murder. Mm. Doesn't look very sad, does he? Mm. No, he doesn't, because after being charged with murder, he engaged with the police in a number of confidential chats where he says, I want to work with the police. And this is what he says. He says, following the charge of Roger Allen Vincent with being concerned in the murder of Robert McGill, I spoke confidentially with Mr Vincent at his request. I've got his signed custody record where he signs it in five places. And his custody sergeant's coming off and on duty where they've signed it. And he says, I want to talk to the police without my solicitor being informed or present. And he's taken off to the interview room on a number of occasions. Mr Vincent, he reaffirmed that he had not been present when McGill was shot and was shocked that he'd been charged with the offence. He wanted to do a deal whereby the charge would be dropped. In return, he said he would supply, through his solicitor, a statement accounting for his prints being in the car and he was supplying on a confidential basis details of the two persons responsible for the murder. The person who put them up to it, including how much was paid, he stated that it had in fact been paid to kill McGill, and they were responsible for another one whereby, it's been blanked out that, had been killed. From the limited details he gave, it was clear that he referred to the murder being investigated in Surrey. He said that the killers had been paid, that's been blanked out again, he intimidated, intimidated, that's my poxy teeth, that turkey teeth. He got the old new na 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 Nashers. <laughs> <laughs> Should have seen one of the interviews I've done, like, I was talking like that. 30,000th of the way I was talking I did a Channel 5 documentary and I only just had them done. Okay. Oh my God, I look like a bleeding squirrel. <laughs> but he says, let's get back to this. <laughs> um, uh, he said, from the limiting details he gave, it was clear that he referred to the murder being investigated in Surrey and that the killers had been paid. He intimated that the Purcell family, uh, including such and such, had had an involvement. 
he's just making up all these names to bring attention to make the case, give some more meat on the bones, because these people are known. By saying their names, the police have gone, oh, really? Uh, he stated that a thorough police investigation would net everyone involved, ex with the exception of someone we refer to, I'm not mentioning his name, he's dead now, he did not get his hands dirty. And it just goes on, there's more of that type of stuff. So what was the, what was the headline then? The headline was Hitman. Were, you, were, you, were they saying that you were a hitman? Yeah, Vincent said I could. They were, if I'd have got acquitted for the murder of Robert McGill, there was three police forces waiting to dock arrest me, based on what Roger Vincent had told them. And he told them what? That I'd committed th uh, a number of murders. I was responsible for them. So more murders than McGill, and other, others, the other ones. Yeah, there's a murder they said I committed for a prime minister of another country, in this country, that. And as a result, uh, they suspended links of England over this, and I've got the documentation. What country is that? Uh, uh, it was uh, Kiev, uh, Chechen authorities. Yeah. So. Bloody hell. Yeah. So there was that. Uh, that was quite difficult. So I'm thinking. That's danger. Well, I'm thinking. Hold on a minute. Yeah. Based on one person say so. Yeah. But they cleaned the books up. And as a result of that, they said he's going to prison. And that's what I did. They sent me to prison with no evidence, circumstantial evidence that was conjured up, fabricated, cleverly chosen words and theatrical performances. And the evidence that they convicted me on, they built around me once they arrested me. I wasn't arrested due to the evidence that they already had in their possession. So where were you that day of the killing? I took my kids to school. Yeah. I was in uh, Bedfordshire. So you were miles away? Miles away. Wow. And then Spackman, the copper, he went round to my house and threatened my, the mother of my children. He said, we're going to nick you. Now, bear in mind, we've had two lots of armed old police go through the front door. To your wife's house? With the kids. Okay. Oh, my God. Once when they nicked me, then the second time, yeah. they went back again. She was a nervous wreck. Turning up at a, at a school, she was a, a, working as a, a, a playground attendant. Mm -hmm. um, turning up, phoning her up. Well, you know the rest, doesn't you? Mm. So, um, didn't go down very well. Where, at the time, I, I thought, this isn't right. There's something not right about this. And then, of course, years later, I found out so much information now that's made the book and my conviction unsafe. So the two people who got, com got accused of murder, did they go to prison? They're now serving a sentence for another murder of David King who got killed in Hertfordshire with an AK-47. By that time, Spackman had been nicked and sent to prison for stealing £160,000. Um, so Spackman's the copper who... Christopher Spackman. Okay. And he was he was in control of uh, disclosure. Sorry, he was in control of disclosure, um, exhibits, and we were receiving information from the police saying, contact the officer in the case, Spackman. Contact the officer in the case for disclosure, Spackman. Yet when I went up for appeal, mm. they said his, his part in my case was minuscule. He, he wouldn't have affected the trial. But mm. now we've obtained the evidence, quite clearly shows he was in at the helm of everything and controlling the evidence that I didn't get and manipulating the evidence that they put before the jury to get me convicted. Why well, his little informer, Roger Vincent, walked off. And Vincent was acquitted at halfway... Uh, submissions by the judge, which we had no idea it was going to happen. The case was stopped and the judge acquitted him by the judge's direction. Yet, Vincent, I'm saying, if you have said you want to work with the police and give information on the murder and you're charged with murder, mm. then surely the jury should have been told about that, mm. that you're giving information about how it was committed and who was paid. Mm. And then you decide if you think he's guilty. Mm. He was in a pub bragging that he killed McGill with Smith. He was in a pub showing off a gun where <clears throat> a gentleman was caught with a car that was loaned to me. He was paid to burn it, and he said he got it off of Roger Vincent and David Smith. His statement was suppressed, and I got it 12 years later. Wow. Yeah, because they couldn't go forward with that, with the, tr with the conviction against the trial, if they'd disclosed that statement to yeah. me, because I would have said, well, hold on a minute, you've got someone here saying it's them. Yeah. And there's other, other statements like Why that. Why were they up for blaming you? I was uh, known in the area, um, easy to fit up. Mm. I ducked and dived, you yeah. know. I worked at the security firm, mm. 
I've, I've still to this day want to know why why and now it's come out that he has been working with the police and I've got a statement from his psychiatrist saying that Vincent told him he said the police arrested him and Vincent said I don't know anything about the murder but I'll say whatever you want mm. and that's from his, psych his psychologist mm. and I've got plenty of other stuff like that that I'm going to be doing a live PowerPoint podcast soon mm -hmm. with a, a, a barrister called Dominic D'Souza, who's a leading QC in the country, and we're going to discuss the legalities of the conviction against me, the investigation against me, where police officers were refused to be interviewed about my murder when they was reinvestigating it. Mm -hmm. And that, that was by their own colleagues of Hertfordshire Police Force. Now, if Hertfordshire Police Force are paying for a, a review of that murder, and you conducted that review, you can't tell your bosses you're not going to take part in that yeah. investigation. Yeah. Where's the hierarchy yeah. in that? Yeah. And, then, and, and the investigating officers of Hertfordshire Police Force were denied access to all the papers in the case. So how can that be a thorough investigation? Mm. It's not transparent, is it? Mm. And that's because they're hiding stuff. Yeah. How long did you get put down for? Uh, I served 20 years in one go. Uh, they asked for 30 in court, stood up and asked for 30 years. So you were getting put put in prison for 30 years for something you didn't do? Yeah. In the old, court bay, old, the old Bailey Court 2, high security court. My God. <clears throat> All the flashing lights, the armed guards, helicopters, snipers on the roof of the court, armed old bill behind the judge, 24-hour armed guard on all jury members, complete 24-hour guard. You don't stand a chance. I had a hung jury the first trial and a 10 to 2 majority on the second. But Spackman, for instance, stopped my solicitor during the second trial, down the, in the first trial, should I say, going down the corridor. Mm. He told him to split of the jury dodge. Mm. Now, what goes on in that jury room is meant to be sacrosanct. So there's, 12, there's 12 in the jury, right? Yeah. Yeah, OK. And he, he told him to split, eight to four. We don't know if that's for or against. Yeah. But how did he find out that? Yeah. Where's Spackman today? I don't know. I think he's down south, down this way somewhere. Is he? Because <clears throat> he's had some interviews in the Hilton Hotel in Southampton. Mm. I got released as a result of some paperwork was sent to my solicitor from an, an anonymous source. And it was a springboard for getting me out of prison. And I went through the prison system at a great pace of knots when they were refusing to take me off the book. Mm. All of a sudden I've got the prison director waiting outside my cell mm. to ask me if this paperwork's correct. Mm. I said it was, and, and that's Danny McAllister, by the way, a big Scotsman, and I, a man's man, and I've got a lot of time for him. Yeah. I've seen him have a go at staff. How long, how long, when you got put away for 20, what was that feeling like when you're sitting in the dock going, I've not killed this man, and I'm getting put away for 30 years to do 20? <clears throat> well, no. If they're... The, if they're the, if they'd have given me 30 years, I'd have had to serve 30 plus. Yeah. So, well, not in all cases. Vincent mm. got a 30. He had five taken off of a pill. He's now in Five Wells. I've got to say this, by the mm. way. He's in a brand new prison called Five Wells, which they don't take lifers, but it's a state-of-the-art prison. He was moved from Oak... Uh, Oak... Oak... What's it? Oakwoods? I think the name of it. Mm. Up in Peter Bar. Yeah. He was moved from there for his own safety because of the, being a wrong one. Mm. And now he's in a state-of-the-art prison with the governor of that previous prison when he's not meant to be in there. Mm. All right. So when I got sentenced to my bleeding sentence, I'd, I wouldn't be in, them, in that condition, in that uh, situation now where he is. I'd, I was still in Cat A grey system. So a, just explain to the listeners what a Cat A is compared to just being in a normal prison. But the Cat A system was brought in for the IRA mm. originally. People don't, not a lot of people know that. Mm. Or serious gun crimes or drugs because. Many years ago, not everybody had guns. Yeah. Uh, and you certainly weren't given to young kids. Yeah. And you'd be frowned upon if you had. Yeah. Um, so you'd look along the landings, you'd have IRA, 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 murder, drugs. Yeah. But no bleeding Christ. There's, there's that many uh, cat A's now. Yeah. They've become the norm. Yeah. Um, very difficult to live in. What a cat A? Yeah, because depending on what grade Tell, give you Give me are, an example of your day in a, as a Cat A prisoner. Well, I was triple Category A when I was first, when I got a uh, place. So it goes right. up again. It goes Cat A, double A, triple A. Triple A, yeah. Is that right? Not a lot of people know about exceptional risk. But it's fact. Absolutely fact. I was, uh, and, and I've had people commenting on uh, 
websites and stuff that are about me being exceptionalist. He said, there's no such thing. Well, Channel 5 said there is such thing mm. on Balmarsh Maximum Security Prison last Wednesday, and they asked me about it. So, yes, there is exceptional risk. And I was the only man in the country that was exceptional risk. And let me tell you about being exceptional risk. I was in the special secure unit in Whitemoor, where the IOA escaped out of there, uh, I think it was October, actually, mm. um, 1994. Mm. So it had a massive security uh, lift. And on the outside of my cell door, it's a typical uh, day for me. Yeah. You had two dead bulks yeah. and a padlock. You take the padlock off, the dead bulks off, and then you had to go to an intercom and ask for that door to be open. Where are you going? Mm. You're, a, you're in a prison within a prison, yeah. and then it's caged. Mm. I don't know what they... F and, and you're checked every 20 minutes. So I never realised that I was forever doing this, like I had a tick. Yeah. When I came off the Category A 16 days later, due to this paperwork coming to light, mm. I realised I was doing that, and there was nobody at the door. Yeah because you're checked all the time. Yeah. That's triple A. Yeah. When you get double A, the checks are, are reduced and you get single A, you check twice, night and morning. When, you get, when you're moved around, are you chained up? You're double cuffed with the big padlocks and I mean massive padlocks, okay? And then you're cuffed here, cuffed there. They can put a chain on you and all if they yeah. really want to. Yeah. In a budgie suit, yellow and green. Again, the categorization means you've got to have armed police to move you. Um, you can only be moved from the, uh, the Secretary of State, uh, he can, uh, it was Michael Howard and people like that at the time that upgraded me, and they, not upgraded me, but agreed to impose a new set of uh, guidelines into my handling. So they agreed to bug my legal visits mm. and said that in the interests of security, national security, the Queen and a third party, they would listen to your conversations with the, your solicitor but they wouldn't use them to affect your trial. Mm. It's bollocks. It's bollocks, yeah. It's bollocks, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So you've got to go all through that. Yeah. Your jury is selected. The information that is used to convict you is also, uh, it's under scrutiny, public immunity interest. Roger Vincent's confidential chats were disclosed at court to him at an ex parte hearing where I weren't at court. Mm. Did they ever try to say to you, speak up, I'm going to give you a lesser sentence? Right, I'm going to tell you something. So I, was, I spent a lot of time in the block. What's the block? S segregation. But it, you've got to understand this. So isolation, um, it isn't like mainstream segregation where people are shouting out the windows. Yeah. Y you're isolated from that because you're in your own prison, not inside of a prison yeah. with its own walls. Yeah. So you've got your own block. I spent a lot of time in that block on my own. and uh, Just four walls? Four walls, nobody else. So, so it is like uh, Cool and Luke, still shaking that tree, boss. Mm. When they sling you mm. in the slammer, mm. you are on your own. Mm. You ain't got no one to talk to. So you become accustomed to your own uh, personality. Mm. Um, and how many hours a day are you in there? 23 hours. I used to paint, painting by numbers. I thought I was brilliant. Mm. <laughs> 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 so 23 hours stuck in a cell no one to talk to no one to, nothing, nothing to do I had pigeons mm. pigeons used to come down to my window I fed them wood pigeons mm. mad you end up feeding you got pets didn't you did you did you ever think you might lose the plot in there um, I don't think I'd, I'd lose the plot I thought that um, I was very determined in that I weren't going to let, let them beat me Yeah. so I thought I'm not going to let them get away with this yeah and that was the approach. But the obstacles you face mm. are far reaching. Go on. <sighs> Prison was run on violence then. It's, it's so much now, but cons are a lot more violent. Mm. Young kids with nothing to lose for mm. years, but <clears throat> very difficult to, you're isolated from your family. I couldn't touch no one. I was on permanent closed visits. Um, you had to be specially cleared by the police to come and see me. All your numbers have to be cleared. Um, the number, your phone calls are always listened to, staff sitting there, the tape recording you at the time, used to push a button, say, right, make your call, to check the number, let you make the call, tape record you, write down notes while you're making that call. You know, I could be talking to someone who's died, mm. uh, a family member, who's, my family member, mm. someone's died, uh, my son. So 
it's sometimes, so my son, Tommy, he says to me, Dad, can I ask you something out of the blue? Now I've got a prison officer sitting where you're yeah. sitting. I said, of course you can, son, what is it? He says, when you look at sexy girls, does your willy stand up? Because mine does. <laughs> so <laughs> and so does Aaron's. He grasps his brother up. <laughs> I went all the time, so, son. Don't worry about it. <laughs> how old? How old was? How old were your kids? How old were your kids when you got put away? Five and seven. Five and seven. Mm. How heartbreaking was that for you? I didn't get to see him after that. When I got put in a unit, it's too or traumatic for him. That was it. Nine years didn't see him. You didn't see him for nine years. Of course, I didn't have a dad when I was a kid. Yeah. My dad was whatever happened, yeah. and then. I felt that. Yeah. Felt it badly. Because I've always wanted to be there for my kids. Mm. I'd be the only dad at the training ground if it was pouring down the rain or snow. Yeah. I'd be standing there. Yeah. I played Father Christmas at the school. Mm. I want to be part of my children's mm. lives. And then it's taken away from me. Very difficult. Because you want to be there to install uh, good building blocks for your kids to go out into, the, into yeah. society. Yeah. Well balanced young men. Yeah. And of course, I was taken away. What was the feeling like being inside, knowing you hadn't done it? Were you angry? Were you screaming and shouting at the screws to tell them it's not me, I've been convicted for the wrong thing? What did you do in those 20 years to really throw your weight around in there? Well, I didn't throw my weight around. What I did do, I did it some staff and I did it a lot of comms, but I seemed to fall out with the arseholes. Yeah. So I had quite a few prison officers threatening me. I just, whatever happened there, I ended up asleep on the floor literally or... Um, Would you not care if well I've got 20 I've got nothing to lose was that in your in your mind No just don't threaten me Yeah Don't fucking threaten me cuz yeah. I won't tolerate you can wrap me up you can bend me up you yeah. can zip tie my arms zip tie my legs carry me to a strip cell take all my clothes off me leave me in a strip cell till you see I'm fit to come out mm. and believe me long periods naked in a concrete cell with no bed nothing All right Just imagine a concrete room grey concrete that's it it's to sling me in there naked. You get sores on your bleeding sides. You can't lay down. The floor's cold when the sun goes down. You start shivering at night. And they use it to break you. But I, I just decided you ain't never going to break me. And I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. You threaten me, I'm going to hit you. That was my approach. And then what that did was that the staff were saying, listen, he ain't a bad lad. Yeah. He's respectful. He don't like bullies. Yeah. Uh, he don't bother us. He gets pissed. Mm. But he dances and sings and mm. puts his music up. Well, we like his music. Yeah. Played a bit of... <laughs> a bit of soul. <laughs> I work playing the boom, boom stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I've gotten well with the staff in terms of... I just... I just did my bird, but I fought my case extremely hard. So my cell became the war office. Mm. And I had... They had a whole... If they moved me, they needed a, a real long cat a van to put all my paperwork in it. They couldn't move me in a small one. Or he has to send it down with another van. But I wouldn't move. I said, I'm not moving until uh, my paperwork comes with me. Or go and get kitted up and we'll be fighting. Yeah. But I'd had so many tear ups with the Mufti by now. What's the Mufti? Mufti is a, dis uh, a description of clothing where it's um, it's got another meaning, but I can't remember now. But it's the right squad. Crash helmet, shields. Well, they come in with, in the right squad to pin you down, tie you up. Yeah. yeah bend yeah. you over. Wrap you up. Well, I don't know about bend me over. But, not, the same. No. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like wrap you up and then... Well, they had a problem about they have, a few would times. They, would they be at me? Is it... Were they partial to smashing you to bits if they fancied it? So Jason Delahoy, he's a, he was a screw, taffy. Yeah. Right last fella. And I was in the unit and he says... Uh, he left the job, he's a postman, right? And he works with children. But he said, I had to come in to wrap me up, right? And he said... There was a protest going on. So Matthew Williams got uh, seven life sentences for uh, threatening to impregnate Manchester City Council's water reserves. He was holding them to ransom. Um, he got seven life sentences. The screws went in and wrapped him up. He hadn't done a thing wrong. Not a bit of violence in him, natural yeah, violence. Yeah. Um, next thing you know, well, flaps uh, come. I pushed, I pushed the, the bell, actually. Uh, screws come and he said what is it Kevin I said you know when two boxers are in the ring and the bell goes he went yeah I said the bell's just gone off mm. walked to back of my cell and waited for the door to come and they come crashing in on me we had a big tear up uh, after that happened I'm taken to the uh, strip cell or the box they call it now mm. and he said Kevin he said we were told to get you out of the way because if we get you out of the way he said everybody else will fall is that right yeah and he said honestly Kevin I said I don't know 
Did you just, did you just become immune to this, knowing they're going to come in, they can do this, you strip you down, wrap you up, throw you in there? Yeah, did so just come, just come like, oh, here we go again. It might be a little bit difficult for listeners and viewers to understand this, but look at what's going out in uh, Russia and that at the moment. Okay, you don't become you're not immune to it, but you get accustomed to what's going on around you. Yeah. Look at some of these places in the world where they're being bombed constantly. Mm. It becomes yeah, the norm. The norm, okay. Uh, and you do, yeah. I did become accustomed to it. It's just one of the things. For if you're in a box and you're in category AAA, and you were seen as one of the most dangerous people in the country, how can you get your voice out to get this overturned? You start writing letters. So my first letter I wrote, I wrote to David Jessel. So the IRA boys told me that there was a wrong one in the in the unit and. Um, they gave me his name. He's now dead, so I won't give his name, but he weren't a, 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 a favourable character at all. Um, I landed in the unit in Whitemore. Um, the lads were saying, Kevin, shouting out the window, just wait till the, we get around to see you, Kevin. Don't do anything stupid, because I was volatile. Yeah. You know, what you sound screaming and shouting from the rooftop. So sound, someone who's innocent will scream and shout more than anybody else. Yeah. Uh, because they're just going nuts. Yeah. That was me. Yeah. So I channeled my aggression at the arseholes on the landings that I was living with. Yeah. I'm on about cons. Yeah, okay. Who think you fucking... Yeah. What are you in for? Yeah. They, 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 I can say no more. Yeah. But that's sort of the day where they wouldn't be on the bleeding landings, rapists and yeah. pedophiles and shit like that, yeah. right? And if they had a smell about them, they got whacked. Yeah. But... I did shout from the rooftops, fighting my case. Um, it was very difficult. So I've gone to the unit. This fella's in there. The door's opened. It's a Geordie, and he's walking along doing this. Yeah. All right? I thought, well, there's only one Geordie in here, and that's the wrong one. Yeah. All right? Next, you know, he's asleep on the floor, mm. absolutely unconscious. They had to carry him off. He didn't wake up for five minutes. Mm. Must have been the best punch of my life. <laughs> <laughs> but I leant over him, yeah. and I said, no one can say I've ever told him anything. Yeah. <laughs> Like, well, if you've got a grass in there, I ain't talking to him, all right? So I went, I then got put in the strip cell and I picked a pen up and I wrote to David Jessel. So for those, if you watch Panorama, Last Chance for Justice, you will see David Jessel on there. He was the CEO of uh, Trial and Error back in the day. Do you remember that, Dodge? Mm, no, I don't. It's like rough justice. Mm. And I wrote a letter to him. And that was the first thing How I do did. you know he got it? I used to send all my letters recorded delivery. And he replied. Okay. I sent every single letter recorded delivery, whether it's a parcel or a package or, or, or a folder, every single one. So I started writing letters, and seven years later, Sally Chidzoy, former BBC producer, came forward after written some, interviewing some police officers, one serving, one not serving, and said, Kevin ain't innocent. Mm. Spackman had to write a statement out naming Lane for the murder, mm. and Smith signed it, and it was put in front of the judge under public immunity interest, sensitive material. She said, he's innocent. Mm. And Spackman told them he had to think cleverly about how he worded the statement. Mm. So that's not me saying it. This is BBC journalists being told by police officers. Mm. And she did the first BBC broadcast on me when I was in Whitemore Prison. It was seven years later. And from that, it just grew. But I used to work off the basis. If I send a, send a hundred letters, yeah. I'll get one, one reply. Okay. And I would just keep doing that and doing that and doing that until it got me where it did. How did you get your head round when someone said, what did they actually sentence you for? How long was it actually they sentenced you for? So the judge sentenced me, he said, uh, I sentenced you to life imprisonment. I didn't know the system. And I said, well, how long have I got to do? Like a dope, if he'd have, I shouldn't have asked that. Yeah. Because then you get what's called a recommended sentence. And yeah. a recommended sentence means you will serve, if he said 30 years, a you minimum. will send a minimum yeah. of that, and then we will look at you. Yeah. All right? He said, take him down, take him down. Took me down. Three years later, I'm going to get uh, down the surgery to get a bit of grub. Or we cooked our own food, yeah. but it was New Year's Eve. Yeah. And there was this uh, senior officer, and he were not a, f- a liked character. Lane, he goes, I've got something for you. I thought, yeah, what do you want? You ain't got nothing nice for me. And he gave me my sentence. It was a tariff. from the d- Three years later. Wow. It said 18 years. I wow. went, fucking hell, that's a result. <laughs> 
Because <laughs> I well, thought I was going to do 30 so years. Like, <laughs> I just took a few it's years off. It's like a win-win there, isn't it? Touch. <laughs> how would you, you get your head round? Even then, getting that piece of paper was going, I actually know now I've got to do a minimum 18 years. How do you get your head around that? So Pat Purcell said to me, Kevin, don't get bitter because it will change your personality. And yeah. I like a laugh. I like yeah. a bit of fun. And I, I, you know, I, I, I've, I've had lots of physical violence in my life. It's, it's extracted from me. I don't like it. Don't tread on my toes because I stamp on yours. Yeah. But leave me alone. So because I'm nice natured and yeah. polite, people then think you're a fucking idiot, didn't yeah. you? So Pat said to me, don't change your, your personality. Kevin, this is your life. He said, you're now in prison, he said, and make the best of it. Mm. And I thought, you know what, you're absolutely right. Yeah. And I made my life in prison the best I could for me mm. whilst I was in there. I thought, because this ain't no dress rehearsal. Yeah. So I need to have a laugh, mm. carry on having a laugh, have a drink, practice a few new dance moves. <laughs> <laughs> Two left feet. Come to some of your festivals soon. <laughs> So what is it? So actually inside the prison, how easy is it to get anything you want in there? Is there a lot of drugs in there? Is there a lot of alcohol in there? Can you get mobile phones? Who brings this in? Phones weren't around yeah. in the prison when I first went yeah. away. Drugs were heroin, massive amounts of heroin. Is that right? It was frowned upon, but there was lots of it. And then you're getting faces that were getting on the gear. Yeah. Because of the sentence they would do and if I can get off of it, they're strong characters and all. Yeah. Nobody's fools. Uh, not all of them, of course. But then it just... It grew, and then the spice came in, crack. What's the spice? It's uh, it's a tranquilizer, like a. Uh, I've been told it's a tranquilizer that they use to transport fish. Don't know how true that is, but it's a herb, and uh, it absolutely, they don't know where they are, what they're doing, and they think they're having heart attacks. Yeah, okay. And you started seeing people coming into the prison, bringing that and selling it because yeah. it didn't show up on on the uh, on the drug test. Tests. Yeah, yeah. And they started taking that. Wow. And what was it? And how did, did you ever make an effort to get on with the cons? Or did you see them as the enemy? No, I got on with the cons. No, sorry, the cons, they had the screws. So, uh, a prison officer I know called Wayne Deadman died a few days ago. I was to go and see him. George Shipton, Phil Prout. I can go on and on. Gareth Fox. These are staff in the job that used to argue with other staff. Yeah. All right? And they used to be called certain names about, oh, you're... Moddy cuddling the staff. He said, no, I don't like what you're doing. Yeah, okay. They're, in it, they're not in it to be punished any more than what they're in it for. Yeah. And you're bullying them. Mm. And I just, I just think, fucking hell, like, that's a decent man standing yeah. there or a decent woman. Yeah. And people need to understand something. If it weren't for the good in the job, mm. could you imagine how bad those places would be? Yeah. For those people that have had, hadn't had a visit or they've had to get a phone call jacked up to speak to someone who's died. Yeah in the family or yeah. a loved member of the family they've got to keep that in mind so I'm grateful for the good in the job and I got on with staff and I still get on with staff now mm. who become friends mm. and there'll be cons out there now to say what friends with a screw yes I am friends yeah. with ex-screws yeah. and they left the job for, for, for certain reasons mm. but they're decent people and they could have been there the same as us yeah. just a left turn or a right turn what would you do to the prison system today I would bring in segregation for Islam because Islam has got a massive, has had a massive effect on the prison population. You've got people going into the system, signing up to Islam for the protection of Islam, for people that are using their religion in the wrong manner. Listen, my girlfriend's half Iranian and half Indian. Yeah. I'm not bleeding uh, racist, yeah. but I don't like people signing up for it to bully people or to use it to... Uh, promote their cause because most of the terrorists that came into the prison system were all about converting people. So there was a fella from Brighton and he was a nobody. He was part of the, um, some British bleeding organisation. I forget who it was now. Um, you know, uh, I forget the name of it, but fighting, you know, he was fighting against foreigners. Yeah. I forget who it was now. He came into the system converted. He ended up with seven life sentences because what it is, you're not liked. Mm. No one really likes you. You've not been liked at school. You're not liked in society. Yeah. And then he said, oh, come here, brother. Come here, brother. Cuddling him. He's getting covered by 10 or 15 different people. Yeah. Next to me, he's got the great big beard. Yeah. He's got the gear. He's crashing on the floor and hitting the mat. Yeah. He's loved. Yeah. He's brainwashed. And then they're going out in society, killing people, stabbing them, chopping them, or putting bombs on them, or com committing acts in prison. Mm. So what I believe, if you come into the system... 
you sh- and you don't like music being played, you don't like alcohol, you don't like drugs, which there's a lot of problems in the prison for that, you don't like cooking bacon in the kitchen, mm. you're now stamping your authority, well, we cook bacon in this country and mm. we eat it for years. Mm. And now you want to change that. And as a result of that, there's a lot of problems. Mm. So I'm saying, if you come into the system and you don't like all of that, it would stop people being converted because they're frightened. So have prisons for just uh, Muslims, yeah. especially the terrorists. Mm. So they can't uh, eradicate, uh, convert people. Mm. Um, I would change that definitely. Okay. Is that but a big problem, is it? Massive. Okay. Mass- There's people who have converted I would never have believed have converted. Mm. Unbelievable. Mm. Because they're frightened. Mm. Make no bones about it. In the prison system now, I see a system where they're boiling up fat or melting plastic bottles or putting batteries in them, slinging them in someone's face. Mm. Their face goes like crackling. Yeah. Ears fall off. Yeah. That's, that is very frightening. And yeah. I've seen that. Yeah. So to the average man who thinks, cool, I don't know that, I'll just convert. Right. Because they don't want all that. Mm. People coming in their cell and saying, listen, brother, you've got to convert, you've got to get off the wing. Wow. But they never fucking said that to me because I'd have punched them straight away. Mm. But they knew that and all. Mm. But I had a bit of a, I was well liked. Well, I was had like, a reputation. Had a reputation, but I was liked for the right reasons. Mm. So they was dead keen to get me to convert. Were they? Yeah. There's a fella, I fucking forget his name now, the uh, Ministry of Sound, he got done for the bombing that lot, com- uh, planning to bomb them. Yeah. Do you remember that, that mm. lot? Mm. I was on the rowing machine, I used to row a lot. Yeah. He's sitting down on the mat while I'm rowing. Talk to me about various stuff. I said, listen, I'm trying to work out here and I ain't never converting, you ain't never going to change me, so like, leave it there and yeah. clear off. Yeah. But that's what they do. Yeah. And I would also have prisons where, and let's not, let's not just focus on that too much, yeah. but it's a massive problem that the prison system have got uh, and it's it's way out of control now. So they need to segregate people for their own reasons mm. during the prison system mm. for the benefit of the bigger population. Mm. I would have prisons where if you want to come off the drugs, you go to a prison and you're on closed visits permanently for at least six months to give you a chance to get off of it and get that thought pattern. They say 21 days starts to become yeah. a habit. Yeah. Um, 90, you, 90 days to change a habit. 90 days to change yeah. a habit. So have prisons where permanently closed visits. If you want to come off drugs, then go through this to get yourself clean. Are there any prisons you've been to? What are the toughest prisons you've been to? Whitemore, Long Larton, Fulce, I haven't been to Full Sutton, uh, Franklin. Very, very, very violent. So, this. As you, what's the feeling like? You come out, they're moving you from prison to prison, you're cuffed up, armed guards, they move you to the next prison. As you're walking to prison, do the prisoners know who you are, who's coming yeah, in? Yeah. They go, oh, here comes Kevin Lane. They know yeah. he's on his way. So, I was known in the prison system, but please don't, I'm not doing none of this. No, no, right? yeah. I just wanted to realise I had no idea how it worked. So, I'm yeah. in white, I'm in Belmarsh unit, banging out a screw a month, big bodybuilders they were. Threatening me, right? Yeah. Threatening to kill me and stuff like that. Yeah. I knocked him spark out. He slid down the wall. He had to go to hospital. I got charged for GBH. Yeah. But the staff said, but he's been threatening them all day. Yeah. And I remember staff made a statement saying, he has been threatening Lane all day. Yeah. Lane's done nothing. He's yeah. just quite lad. So, what was the question again? I was saying about the how dangerous the prisons are. Yeah, so so my, my question was, when you come into a prison, as you're walking in, everyone's looking at yourself, oh, Kevin Lane's on his way. because yeah, they've heard about you knocking out staff yeah. in the unit. Yeah. So when you get there, how oh, this is Kevin Lane. Yeah. But they fit you to be six foot six and six foot six wide. Yeah. And they see a young boy, baby fresh in front of them. Yeah. Happy go lucky. Yeah. I think, blimey. But then the same goes on. You end up having a few run-ins here and there. Mm. So you're known mm. before you get there. And you walk into the prison system and because you're making a stand where, let me tell you now, not everybody makes a stand like you would think. Yeah. They suffer people on the landings. Not everybody, I believe me, there's a lot mm. of very dangerous men in the prison system mm. with good morals. Mm. But you then become a bit of a lone soldier yeah. because people want to go home. They don't want to make a stand yeah. because he shouldn't be on the landings. Because yeah. you've got to go and tell your family that you've got a paedophile living next door to you Bloody or a yeah. rapist. You know, so on your landing, give an example of how many people would be on, a, on your landing. Depends on the style of the wing. Mm. You could have 24, you could have 120. And you would know within time who's who in each, in each cell? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, my next door neighbour in one prison in Whitemore was involved in torturing war veterans from Poland across Europe for their savings. I found out who he was, 
I said, you better get off the fucking landing. Mm. If you're here when this door opens, things ain't gonna be very good mm. for you. So I tried to do it the right way. Yeah. You know? He was gone. Yeah. And, and as well as a few other matters. You know, staff used to tell you, listen, he ain't no good, that one. One fella, I think it was seven or nine counts of robbery by knife, two of the women pregnant. And he had one of the women captive in his house, in her house, with her children. Well, he got it. Yeah. And, uh, and But I realised then that my moral code thought, this isn't right. Yeah. Because I was suffering for it. Yeah. And I'd been bounced around the prison system. I'd 18 moves in four years. Yeah. 18. You're just bouncing, 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 bouncing all the time. Did they think, do you reckon the prison system felt like, oh, Kevin, like, he's a nuisance. We don't want him in our prison because he's banging out banging out the staff. Stop. Well, the staff stopped leaving me alone yeah. after a while. I said, don't fucking... On my record, it says, don't threaten Lane because you'll have a problem. Yeah. If you try and tell uh, Lane black is white, you will have a problem. Yeah. And he will do something. Yeah. If Because I'm very angry about being in in the first place, so I'm not going to have you threaten me. Yeah. And I don't see why I should have to suffer your bollocks yep. and your rules that are wrong in the first place half the time. Mm. And, and, and I was a very angry young man. Mm. Are I'm, you still angry today that you got put away and you did 18 years at that time? When I'm talking to you, Dodge, it comes out in me. Yeah. Because I start thinking about some of the people I used to live with. Mm. And there's so many people going to prison, but they're not bad people. Mm. They've just done something wrong. Yeah. Or, but they come back out and they change their lives. Yeah. Around. However, um, I am. I wouldn't. I'm angry. I'm still battling this today, yeah. and the criminal justice system is still trying to push it under the carpet. Although the book clearly highlights that I've had, I've been fitted up. Yeah, clearly. And you don't have police officers come forward, do you, and say you're innocent if you're fucking guilty? Did you do the full eighteen years? I did twenty. You did twenty in total. You got an extra two for banging people out. Well, they said you're never going home, Lane. You're never going to go home. We don't know how you've, you, this has happened. Where'd you get the other two from? No, what you do, you get released when they feel you're no longer a danger to society. Yeah. So I, a, a screw come up to me and said, I don't know what you've done, he said, but it's written on your file. You're not to be released until you're very old or dead. Is that right? Yeah. And I know through looking at other people in the system that have no trouble, just sitting there in denial, can't get off the book. Look at Mickey Steele. He's 77. Mm. He's just come off the book. Mm. Jack Rowan's for the uh, Essex boy murder. Jack's been home a little while. Okay, but... Charlie Bronson? I'm doing a documentary with... Uh, um, with I can't go into the details, yeah. but Charlie, he's got a, a parole hearing coming up. Yeah. Does he deserve to be in prison that long? Mm. Because you're put in a prison, in a system that is run by violence. Mm. You're put in a jungle where violence runs it. So you've got a... The staff can't protect you, mm. so you've got to resort to what is normal. You need to do. You yeah. need to defend yourself mm. because they will come in, they will, and for anybody who don't believe this, sexually assault you, rape you, stab you. Who? Cons. Take your food off you, take your possessions off you, blackmail you, make you phone your family up to send money over. How do you, do you run to the staff? Of course you don't, because you're in your grass. Yeah. A lot of the cons do. Yeah. But then it comes out, so you make a stand yeah. because you're in there with violent people, but you get punished for being making a stand in your defence. Gets used against you because you've defended yourself, yeah. Yeah. and it says you're still being violent. Yeah. But you, I'm in a system that is violent, yeah. and you can't protect me. Yeah. So you don't go home. Yeah. You go over your tail for longer. But I've got pals in the system who are no problem to anybody. Mm. They can't get off the book. Mm. And you got Vincent and Smith in Five Wells Prison with a handful of years left. And they're flying through the system. Why is that? Is that because they've been working with the authorities? Mm. Of course it is. Mm. Because you see other people, like I say, have no problem, who just stagnate mm. and tread water. Mm. So it's very difficult. What year did you come out? 2015. Then I got recalled for common assault. I did 14 and a half months. What, so you come out and then you got done again? Yeah. I what come happened? Out. Well, I had a girlfriend at the time and she got pissed out of her head. Yeah. Um, hid my keys, my car keys, house keys, and all the rest of it in her freezer, mm. giving it to me drunk. Uh, and I'm on video five times putting her back in the house. And on one of the occasions, she's come out, and I had a uh, nice Range Rover, I had autobiography mm. sport like mm. you, fully loaded. Mm. No. Mm. She's only running up down the side of it with her keys, kicking it and punching it and scratching it. Mm. 
I got out, put my arms around her, put her indoors. Mm. She's then come out, ripped another plate off. Mm. On the fifth and final time, when she's walking around the road, hardly any clothes on, mm. she's got a shirt on, I went and grabbed her and threw her. Mm. I got 14 and a half months for that. Mm. And they're saying, don't worry about provocation, you're a lifer. Mm. You're a life license. You resorted to violence. Yeah, I threw her. Mm. Bloody hell. I went to prison for a non-custodial offence for 14 and a half months. And I'm glad I've got that on camera mm. so I can show people mm. if I want, but I wouldn't do that. Yeah. Okay, it's bad enough that I went to prison for it. It's bad enough what we went through. Mm. Um, and then I got recalled again. For so, you did, so you did the 14 and a half months. How long were you out for before you got put back in again? Two months. You're joking me. And I had a new probation officer I'd never met and he was reporting on me, uh, and he reported a number of facts that were proven to be wrong, and I was released again by the Secretary of State on a Friday night at 7.30. And when you're released, they just go, off you go, you open the door, you're away, no one's waiting for you or anything like that, what's that? Well, they opened the door and said, Lane, get your kit, the Secretary of State wants you gone immediately. I went, shut the door a minute ago, I've got a few things to do. <laughs> so you said, yeah, I did, yeah. I thought, I'm not making out, I've got my fast slippers on, I yeah, want to yeah. get out of here. But the staff was all right, you know. So um, I got my kit, I thought, right, there's lads in here that ain't got nothing. Yeah. And I just boxed it all up and said to my pal next door, Jason Holland, yeah. I said, give this to everybody yeah. who needs it. Yeah. And I got an Uber cab and I had a barn annex in um, Bad Shot Lee for a pal of mine. You Where's should that? Get it. You Where's should, that? Guildford, you should get him on here. Okay. All right. Name? Uh, Gary McCann. Okay. He'd done 168 fights, knocked out five world champions in the gym. He was forced to be reckoned with this okay. day. But now, okay. very philosophical. It's a great storyteller. Okay. Well, anyway, um, I got an Uber cab there. and So we're talking that you've done your 14 months, you've come out. Yeah, and I got an Uber cab to him. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on the second time. There's a pub on the corner of the road. He weren't there, so I went straight to the pub. <laughs> and there, I sat with uh, three old ladies who were in their seventies, yeah. and had a drink with them. Lovely. Bought them a drink, and they bought me one. Bought me one back, yeah, and all bless lovely. them. They wouldn't let me. They said, "No, we've got to buy you a drink." And did you? Did you? Uh, did you learn after that? Are you at a point? How old are you now? You've come out. You've done your 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 twenty years. You've gone and done another fourteen months. How old did you come out that, that second time? Roughly. It's a very personal question. <laughs> You're looking good for your age, to be fair. Well, I'm not going to tell you how old I bleed now, <laughs> but I, I, well, actually, I'm 54. Yeah. So, uh, so r roughly 46. 46 yeah. 47. 47. Okay, 47. And then when you come out of that time, did you think, right, I've learnt my lesson now, I'm not going to be doing anything, I want to go sh full on straight? I set up a company straight away, Yeah. Uh, and that company turned over seven, several million pounds. Mm. Doing uh, what? A uh, uh, building company. Yeah. I had five sites up and down the country. I yeah. did 1.7 million off of one company in one year, and I'd other bits and yeah. pieces. Uh, and I set up a haulage firm. Mm. So lorries taking mucks out the ground and yeah. mucks in. That's still going. Mm. Uh, I just, we had COVID and bits and pieces. Mm. So did you stop went. though? With that second time you come out, do you think you know what? I've I've learnt my lesson. It's taken a long time to be banging people out and and staff and stuff. Did you go? Well, I've come out now. I'm I'm, I'm done. Look, I can trust myself to behave. Yeah. That's the thing. You can't trust other people. Yeah, okay. So if someone winds you up or gets in your face or in your grill, you'll be like, I've got to deal with this. Look, I'll deal with it if you get anywhere near me. Yeah. So don't come past there because yeah. they're coming in my space. What do you want to get so close to me for? Yeah. And you can pretty much tell George can't yeah. you, if someone's going to have a yeah. pop at you. Yeah. So what you must understand is that in prison, you can either become a master at avoiding problems yeah. and calming situations and that's down. that's an art. It's an art. Yeah, you can see a way. So look, yeah, you body language. Down. That's not. That's you know. That's defensive. Yeah. you know. That's up, like begging, not yeah. begging, but reasoning. Yeah. And there's a way of talking to people. Yeah. So I become pretty good at that because towards the latter part of my years in prison, mm. there was very minimal amounts of violence. Yeah. Um, you're always going to get violence when you're known. Yeah. That's a fact. Mm. Um, in Is prison. that? Did you find that people wanted to have a go at you? Because you're like one of the toughest in there. I think, hold on, let's have a go. I'll have, I'll have a go of him. Did you find that, or do people like, you know what, I can't be bothered to have a tear up with Kev? When you listen, you're knocking out fucking great big lumps and yeah. you're fighting, it's like you fight a few people in yeah. one go yeah. and be quite successful. Yeah. Um, as a young man, of course, yeah. not now. Yeah. Um, but people then steer clear of you. Mm. They don't want to make a name for themselves because they know that if they come to you, it's going to be problems. Do you think the. Do you think the system 
criminals being in prison leave prison with a better criminal mind to do more crime? A prisoner will stop committing crime when he's had enough, he's had a life-changing experience, he's had children, uh, or he will just continue to commit crime because that's his life yeah. and he accepts that. Yeah. I came home, I like work, uh, it's a waste of life going to prison, uh, a complete waste of life unless you can bring something out of it for you. But um, I didn't want to go back, so I moved, I changed my circles yeah. to a certain degree. Yeah. Um, but I can be out... Say we was out in a boozer, yeah. okay, and I turn around, I bump into someone, I spit up a drink on him. You fucking idiot. Oh, mate, I'm sorry, listen, I'll pay for your yeah, shirt. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, sorry buddy, mate, it's yeah, just a yeah. bit tight in here, isn't yeah. it? That ain't good enough. Yeah. They look at you because they think you're a bit of a bloody soft touch. Yeah, okay. They're hell bent on putting on you. Yeah. What do you do? Mm. They put their hand on you. Mm. You go and tell your probation officer, yeah, I've knocked him out, but he put his hand on me. Mm. Don't listen, are they? Okay. You've used violence, Kevin. Yeah. And as soon as you lose, use violence again, they look at your record, that's not going to help. So I've got a custody record, not custody record, an access for my son, okay? And it's been going on four years. Mm. And because I've been in prison for contract killing, I'm heavily scrutinised. And it's difficult. So I didn't see my son for a year once because CAFCAS and social services were investigating it. Mm. Closed the case. Mm. And because of my criminal record, I was knackered, mm. fell out with the ex, wallop, mm. and I have to go for all of that now. What's it like coming out of prison knowing that people are saying he's a contract killer, he's a hitman, but he got accused of something that he didn't do? Well, that's it's it's warming when people fight your cause, mm. but it's yeah, it's very warming, mm. very warm. But the flip side is it when they use it against you yeah. for personal matters, like I've just explained. Yeah. That's very detrimental and hard. Yeah. Because you think, I've just spent 20 odd years in prison mm. and now your punishment is still when I'm innocent. Yeah. But to have people stand up and start shouting from the rooftops yeah. that you are innocent, yeah. whether it be journalist Nick Hopkins, Louise Shortier, uh, your solicitor, Mazda Marchin, et cetera, et cetera, then you, and Mark Daly of Panorama, mm. um, you start thinking, well, at last, people yeah. believing in you. Yeah. And so, it's rewarding. It's, and that must be a nice, warm feeling, right? It's unbelievable. Yeah. So I've got a, a producer contacting me from CBS Fox soon in relation to a documentary for Channel 4. Yeah, That's going to go viral. Yeah, that's going to America. Yeah. And I'll be doing that. And I'll be talking about the prison system and the parole system and yeah. so on and so forth. And I'm hoping it'll help a certain person to get his parole. Yeah. Um, do you think they'll ever do a Netflix movie on this story? I have already spoken to someone in relation to Next Fix and these uh, and quite a few other people, and I believe they will. Yes, yeah. Because the book itself is absolutely fantastic. You've yeah. had Ray Burgess, you've had Leon F. Butler. He works with Idris Elba, El isn't mm -hmm. it? Um, uh, Ken Scott and there's uh, Le uh, Leo Greggs. There's other people mm. that have come to me and said, "Kevin, this is a film. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It's a bit like Ruben Carter Smith, The Hurricane. Mm. Mm. You can never believe it happened." The Guildford Four, yeah. what went on with them yeah. uh, in the name of the father. My book is exactly the same as yeah. that. And for the listeners here, tell us about your book. So my book, Fitted Up and Fighting Back, okay, it's on Amazon, um, Waterstones, um, Fitted Up and Fighting Back website. Excellent read. I donate to four charities. I don't make a penny out of it, okay. Um, it's been excellently received and uh, may it continue. Mm. Uh, I try to write messages in. Well, I do write messages in, in all the books that are purchased from the office. Mm. A nice little personalised message. But it goes into detail about the case. Yeah. And there's there's no been no no orders been put on that saying you can't publish that no yeah. more because it's all factual. It's taken from documentation I've had disclosed to me mm. through the criminal justice system. Yeah. And it highlights stuff. So all of that is in f all in the in the whole book are facts. Facts. Mm. And there's stuff in there about coppers visiting people. Uh, investigations that have taken place that have been pushed under the carpet. So a gentleman contacted my solicitor called Tam Dewey. He bought the gun off of Vincent that was used in the murder. He said it was a pump-action shotgun. He came forward and said, there's an innocent man in prison. They fitted him up. Half of police shot up to see him, threatened to nick him for perverting the course of justice. Right. He said, what have I got to gain? Yeah. He said, I've got to face the wrath of the criminal fraternity yeah. for coming forward. Yeah. 
He said, but I would do that and I would get in a box and I would do that because you've got an innocent man in prison mm. and those pair of arseholes have been admitting to this murder and other murders that they've blamed him for. Yeah. Very difficult. Have you had any trouble since leaving prison? So I've got a contract on my life. I've heard it's gone up to 200 grand now. I was just told that the weekend. But I've had three warnings whilst I was in prison. I don't know how many I've had now. I've had that many. I don't even keep counting them. But that is because people don't want the truth to come out, do they? Mm. And they're desperate to shut me up. Mm. So, yeah, I've had people threaten to kill mm. me. I've had a couple of blokes going around uh, three years ago in Watford where well, I couldn't go because I'm not allowed in Hertfordshire. And they went up to someone. So I'm godparent to a Bram one of a Bram well, a Bram which is personal bodyguard. Uh, I'm, I'm godparent to his child. Mm. And these two fellows went up to who they thought was a Bramovich's bodyguard, but it was his, it was my pal's brother. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. They said, listen, blah, blah, blah. We're going to kill Kevin Lane. We're going to put one in his nut. We're friends of such and such. And uh, we're going to do him. So I'll get a phone call. I couldn't go there. But my pal's good. Mm. My pals were sitting there photographing them. Mm. How stupid are them men? Mm. Mm. My mate said, what do you want to do? I said, I'll just take photographs of them. Mm. And we've got them in we if we ever need them. Mm. I like to go and find them and talk about their ways or their... Uh, the error of their ways. So I have that. Mm. I have to be mindful of that because mm. it doesn't take... There's kids running around with guns now. Yeah. Look at little boy Blue in Liverpool. Yeah. It's disgraceful. Yeah. So it doesn't take nothing to kill someone in these kids' eyes mm. no more. So yeah, I have to face with that. But I won't be shut up. Yeah. I go where I want. Um, <sighs> I'm mindful of it, of course. You yeah. think, well, you don't want to go somewhere where you're, you're an easy target. Yeah. So, yeah, I have got a few people want to fill me with holes. Mm. Which is a bit sad, really, because all I'm doing is saying, well, look, if Roger Vincent is saying them confidential chats are uh, they're wrong, that he hasn't made them, then that means that the police have made them up. Mm. And they were disclosed to Vincent's legal team at the, court, at the Old Bailey. Mm. So if the police have made them up, my conviction's unsafe. And if Vincent has said them, then he's fitted me up mm. with the police. So either way, it's a win-win for me. Do you lose sleep over this every night? No. No. No, no I don't, no. No, I sleep pretty well. Yeah. But the case is getting now to the pinnacle where people are actually saying, well, he, he's got a point here. Yeah. If you were to wave a magic wand today, what would be the best case scenario right now? Roger Vincent comes forward and says, look, I was a young lad at the time. I had a nervous breakdown. Uh, I did tell the police this because uh, it got me off. Mm. All right, and or whatever he wants to say, but he do the right thing, and more people will have more respect for him for the right reasons because he then gets my conviction squashed. Mm. I go off into the sunset and carry on. And what aren't you allowed to do right now? I can't leave the country without permission. I can't go on holiday abroad. I can go to work, which I do go to work. I've got uh, business interests abroad, which I go. Yeah. Um, I'd be able to go into a court over, say, access to my son and not be uh, tarnished because of my criminal record. Right, okay. So that follows you about? Follows me everywhere I go. Yeah. And it's, it's disgraceful. I've had one family court judge say, just because Mr Lane's a convicted contract killer doesn't mean he isn't a good father. Yeah. What a touch. Yeah. But it isn't always like that. Yeah. So a, a scenario, just get on with my life, start a new life, move. Uh, move somewhere where I'm away from people. Because yeah. I've been banged up in the house for people for 20 years. Yeah. And I come from the countryside, so that is a bit abnormal for me. Mm. I now want to be in the fresh air, listen to the, 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 the wind and the trees rustling and yeah. a few animals, and watch my grandchildren grow up and my children. Um, and is it freedom for you? It's not freedom when you know they can just come and pay, take you off the street and put you back in. Okay. And... The difference being when you're a lifer, an investigation has to be conducted, but in the meantime, you will be in prison. Yeah, okay. And then you might spend a lengthy time in there. I spent, like I say, 14 and a half months during COVID. Yeah. No courts are open. Yeah. Just banged up. Yeah. That's a big, another 14 and a half months. How long have four. you been out for? June last year. June last year. Mm. What's it like when you haven't seen the world, the outside world for all those years, and now you're coming out and seeing everything change? Have you noticed a massive change when you come back out? There's loads of foreign nationals in the country. 
loads of them. I, was, I went to um, Hull on my first town visit, escorted town visit. I know all these languages. I think, bloody hell. Mm. Different colour there, big bumper trainers and stuff. Yeah. You know? But I thought, well, listen, the country needs it. The, 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 the industry's grown. You need mm. extra staff. That was strange. No Bluetooth. I didn't understand Bluetooth. Yeah. Uh, sat nav, memorable information, different coloured bins, yeah. all that type of stuff. Uh, but I adapted to it because I was hungry for for life. Yeah, I didn't find some people suffer and they find it hard to adjust. What about coming out and eating any food you allowed, any food you wanted to eat? <sighs> I had a Chinese. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> I was in. I had a Chinese, right? And. Uh, yeah, it, it was yeah, it's nice. It's things like that. Booze. I found I could stand up and drink. Yeah, because I was brewing my own booze in prison. Yeah, and that can be 30, 40, 50 percent. Yeah, bloody strong. Hell. I had it tested once after three days. It was thirty one percent. Yeah, I know. I got a bit of bang up for that. <laughs> <laughs> I got a twenty eight day lay down. What's a what's a twenty eight lay down? Calming calming off period. I spent seventeen days in the block. Right, for so a bit just of in the, what, just in that what four set the four corner walls. Yeah, so I spent seventeen days in there. Yeah. Then I was sent on a twenty eight day cooling off pier to Belmarsh Unit, and I was sent to Franklin. I thought, you know, that's a bit strong. Isn't and it? Belmarsh is the toughest prison out there, high security. Um, you got the maximum security unit, but I would say Long Larton, um, Whitemore are the most dangerous. I mean, in two thousand and eleven or twelve. I might be wrong on the facts here. There was five murders in the high security estate that you've never heard of. Wow. Geezer heard his penis cut off, stuck in his mouth. His go- bells were, uh, intestines were gutted. That was in Franklin. You had one in Grendon. But five murders. Now, when I came in in 95, there'd been one murder in eight years. Right. Okay. What does that tell you about the people that are coming in now? Mm, mm. Very violent. Mm. I've seen knives made that big that would go through. From what? You. From what? They only had a bleeding uh, pen, a steel shop yeah. in Long Larton. Right, okay. A steel shop for yeah. Christ's sake. Yeah. Of course, they're all making these bleeding great bit nice, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, Make yeah, you yeah. shiver when you look at them. Yeah. Dangerous. Mm. Kevin, this has been fascinating. I don't know. I think I may have waffled a bit too much. No, here. no. This is really fascinating. I really thank you for coming down here and telling your story. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. It's um, been a, an eventful life, and um, I really hope... You can get your uh, name put out there and, and, and get that freedom that you're after. There's another side, so- thank you, there's another side to me. So we're just discussing a system that ev- ev- evokes a-, a certain personality in me. Mm. But you take me out of here and sit outside there, there's a completely different yeah, person. Yeah, I'm, I'm that's what I'm saying. And uh, You're like a fun, happy, go, have a laugh yeah. person, but if someone flicks your switch... Well, there's a lot of people like that, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, of course. Don't touch me, I won't touch yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I talk about this because I hope it brings recognition to not just myself, but people like Pete Rotul, who's innocent in Franklin, yeah. and others like that. Mm. Uh, and there's quite a few of them. And there's going to be a lot of documentaries coming out on you as well. There is. You get mm. the Fitted Up and Fighting Back website that's got documentaries, Panorama yeah. and that. They said it is a game changer. Yeah. What they And I'm due to go back to the Criminal Cases Review Commission, mm. for them to reconsider my conviction again. Yeah. But let me tell you something about that quickly. This is very important yeah. that people don't realise. So I've had several applications to the Criminal Cases Review Commission. I subsequently found out that uh, the Chief Counsel of Police at the time of my murder was one of the 14 commissioners in there. Mm. Also, the barrister that convicted me, he's now dead, he died of, uh, of cancer tumour. They set up a trust called the Kalisha Trust. The Kalisha Trust supports barristers in their training, working in the CCRC. So if my case comes before them, they're never going to squash my conviction, mm. are they? Mm. I go up on my appeal when I got released from prison based on this paperwork that was sent to my solicitor from mm. an anonymous source. Who do you think I go up in front of on my appeal? Lord Chief Justice Rafferty. Lord Chief Justice Rafferty was sitting at Kalisha's bed when he was dying said we set up the trust she stepped into my appeal two weeks before I went up on it mm. is that not biased mm. further to that in the CCRC I wrote to them and said do anybody in the CCRC knows police officers involved in my case they said yes it's inevitable that p- uh, staff within the CCRC know s- police officers involved in your case or know someone who knows them 
but we do not feel this would cause the impartial observer to form the view of bias. Mm. What do you think? Mm. And I'm only touching on the on the yeah, sur on, surface. If you have come mm. away from the violence here, yeah, okay, and spoke about the criminal justice system and what really goes on, yeah, and I, I, can I just continue yeah, for a little yeah, bit? Yeah, so, um, Private Eye magazine, Heather Mills. Not the Heather Mills, yeah. but a, a, a journalist. She was sitting in this your neck of the woods, Kingston Crown Court, mm. and there was a Derek Webb was a police officer that was following the royal family, and he worked out that they never changed their cars by keeping the same number plate. As a result, MI5 raided the house, took every bit of paperwork out of the house, and then there was a file called the Miscarriage of Justice of Kevin Lane file. He was going to sell that to the media. Mm. Okay, who was Derek Webb, former police officer, yep. turned private eye. Yeah. I wrote to various police forces looking for this file. They denied it existed. Heather Mills wrote to my solicitor and said, I've just been present during a public immunity interest hearing, a, a hearing, shall I say, uh, in relation to this Derek Webb's case. And the miscarriage of justice file came up and they placed it under public immunity interest. And yet they denied it existed. Yeah. And Derek Webb says there's information in there that says Kevin Lane is innocent. Mm. And it's stuff like that that goes on that's in my book yeah. that I haven't discussed here today. But people say, well, that can't be right. Yeah. How can they suppress it? Because I'm entangled with the royal family yeah. and MI5, yeah. I'm never going to get it. Yeah. They will never disclose it. Because yeah. they would never admit that it exists. Mm. But it was mentioned in open court. Mm. So, I'm, I'm really looking forward to reading your book. Look, all I say is this. Yeah. Go to page one. Yeah. If you don't like it, give it to someone you don't like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's a win-win. That's a win-win, isn't it? <laughs> but I know this for a fact. Based on people who have read it, 100,000 in a book club, book yeah. of the year. Yeah. You can't put it down. Yeah. Julie Christie, Oscar winner. Yeah. Couldn't put, put it, it down, down yeah. Kevin. Yeah. And it just goes on like yeah. that. So yeah. I'm pleased with it. And thank you for giving me the time to air my show. But I would like to say this to, to, to your viewers and listeners. Yeah. Violence is a terrible thing. Mm. But why is the world run on violence mm. and force? Where if someone, like Iran, for instance, mm. and their children are dying, why don't our country give them all the medical supplies they mm. need? And if it was your child that was saved by the medication we'd give you, you'd say, England saved my son yeah. or my daughter. Why has it always got to be violence? Yeah. It's sad, isn't it? Because yeah, I don't like violence. Yeah. And I wish the world could be a little bit different. And yeah. More giving rather than... Agree. Totally agree. I do. Kevin. Thoroughly enjoyed that, mate. Thank Thoroughly you very much. It. Thank Good you. Man. Thanks for making the effort down here. And thanks to all the listeners and viewers. <laughs>